G'day guys and welcome back to the Back Pocket Plug Out Podcast. My name is Caden McDonald and I'm joined by my co-host of the show, Connor Rogers. Rog, how are you mate? Yeah, never better McDonald, feeling fantastic. It's a rare day off for me today, so I've woken up bright and early and I've uh, cleaned the house, which usually is an arduous task, it's something I never look forward to, but pumping the tunes and I got into this groove where... After the first five minutes, which was a bit painful, I started to weirdly enjoy it. Mm. You know, it's sort of almost bondage style. I enjoyed the pain. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, the house is now absolutely spotless. Got a fresh haircut. So I hope the people watching it on the YouTube uh, can watch a little more easily this week. And uh, raring to get stuck into a bit of footy. Well, it has been a big weekend of footy. Uh, there's been a lot of chopping and changing of ladder positions. There's been some injuries. We'll get to it all, but I want you to kick off the show with the headline. Yes, as we know, uh, our friends up in New South Wales are getting a bit of the the Melbourne or slash Victoria circa 2020 treatment, <laughs> and they are in a very harsh lockdown. So the headline is Sydney locks down dogs. Nicely done. Um, Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, they uh, Sydney are the headline this week, and there was a few possible headlines. I think there was a big, a lot of big stories. But my biggest takeaway from the round is that Sydney are now firmly in the contender category. Absolutely, I could not agree more. Um, I know the latter positions don't suggest it, but I'd ha- like I am as a D supporter who will be contending and just looking at the top four or five. Sydney are probably the team that do worry me the most potentially. Um, I think they're more of a threat than Port, even though the latter positions don't sort of suggest that. And they are starting to get a little wriggle on at the right time of the year, which is what gets spoken about a lot in the AFL. It doesn't really matter what you do in the first 12 weeks. It's how you're looking with those four or five weeks to go and how you're building. And they are building quite nicely. So they are a genuine threat. Uh, I believe they've beaten three out of the top four teams. So you can't get a whole lot better than that. And that is form that holds up comes September. Uh, and, you know, they've got the X factor. They've got big Budwa down there. So when it comes to finals time and he's hunting for that thousand, thousandth goal, not easy for a man with a list, <laughs> uh, you can guarantee that he'll be firing on all cin- cylinders. And they have, you know, it's been spoken about a million times, so we won't go too far into it, but they have players like Tom Hickey, who they've just plucked from the clouds and is just doing magical things and being the most improved player in the competition. And once again, it's just because of their culture. They can turn average players good and they can turn young players with late draft picks into talented youngsters. So it's unbelievable what they do at that football club. Yep. Heaney... Parker, Mills, Kennedy, Franklin, they are players that are just ready for that September action. Um, A lot of those names have been there a million times before, sort of four or five grand finals um, this Sydney Swan outfit have made in the last 15 years. So uh, they are a genuine, genuine threat. I, uh, I saw an article pop up on my Facebook by 7AFL and they redrafted the Weetering Drafts uh, and they did the top five. Did you see it? I did, yeah. They had Weedering at four and they had Mills at three. Now, <laughs> call me a call me a one eyed Carlton supporter, but <laughs> are you are you taking Mills ahead of Weedering? Is he having that good of a season? Uh I'm not, but I I'd have Dunkley over Mills as well. And I yeah. th- I think Dunkley was sort of pushed to sixth or seventh. And it, it's quite funny because Darcy Parrish, if you did that list at the start of the year, wouldn't be in the top 10. Uh, but now, no. after sort of a good 15-week period, he's right up in contention. So it was sort of done on potentially form of the last couple of weeks, that, that list. <laughs> I'd have thought so. I was a bit taken back by it. But the flip side of the John Longmire-led Sydney coin is that uh, the doggies just uh, didn't seem to turn it on. And... It seems like there's been a couple of times this year where, yeah, and they've had a consistent season, but there's been a couple of times where they've had a loss and then all of a sudden their flaws come to the floor, <laughs> as, yeah. uh, as a poet might say. Uh, and, you, and you see that uh, sometimes their forward line can be a bit dicey and likewise for the back line. They are not in the pretender category, but no, they are far from it. in the... Well, <laughs> They're not in the pretenders pretender. with question marks. They're not in the pretender category, but they do have traits of a pretender where they wallop 
a terrible side. Like they mop a St Kilda, they mop a North Melbourne, they mop a Gold Coast, and then when it's not quite on their terms, um, they can struggle a little bit. I still think that they can get it done and get it right in the finals, and it's not a, a panic button type moment. I think maybe the tag could be downhill skiers if you were going to be critical. Um, but obviously they got players to come back. They've shown that when they're on, they are on, and they will be a very exciting team to watch uh, deep into September. I think uh, what's evident with the Dogs is that their best football is just about the best in the league, capable yep. of beating anyone. Yep. But if they're that 2% off, they are very, very, very gettable. Um, and that's that's where they could be exploited in finals. If they're off for just five minutes, and five minutes can cost you a finals game, um, then they can be exploited. Whereas I think there are other teams. Like I, I look at a Melbourne, and I know you've lost to a couple of teams outside the eight, but I still look at you and, and I don't really see uh, – people talk about your key forward stocks, but I'm not as worried. I don't see as many holes um, or potential holes, and I don't really see that 10-minute lapse that'll cost you a game in finals. I think you're too well regimented for that sort of behaviour. I'd put a Geelong um, absolutely in that category as well. Um, I, I think even if Geelong are off, they still win. And that's yep. a testament to that footy side over the last 20-odd years. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be an exciting end to the season, especially with all the games that are popping up and all the upsets that are happening. But um, a man who gets... Well... St- no, you go. Yeah. No, well, I was going to say that was our headline was the Swans, but that's only because we do this show once a week and what's topical at the moment is the footy just passed. But if we were to talk about the, the, the biggest headline from the past seven days, and it was about seven days ago, um, it was the Clarko Mitchell handover or, or, you know, ta- uh, handover is the right word. Yep. Uh, what, how did you interpret that? Oh, you could see it coming from a mile away. Um, Sam Mitchell didn't seem t- overly interested in the Pies job. Um, it was sort of a little bit of impatience. Everyone sort of waiting to see what Clarkson does or whether Hawthorne would get rid of him. I think to get rid of a champion coach and just sack him wouldn't make sense. And I think to have... But sa- they have sacked him. They have sacked him, though. As far as... I know that it's not a pure sacking because they're um, seeing him out to the end of his contract. Um, but I, in my opinion, I see it as a sacking. Like you're, you're <laughs> saying, we, we don't want you at the club the year after next. For mine, it is b- a bizarre decision to sack the best coach of the generation when it's not like, it's not like he has a list at the moment that should be contending for finals and they're not. Mm. Um, he has... Probably, you know, if not the worst, just about the worst side in the competition, and they're not contending. But he he's shown before that he can rebuild a list and not just rebuild it, take it to a dynasty. So for mine, I was very surprised with the decision. I, I if you offered me right now as a Carlton supporter, Alastair Clarkson or Sam Mitchell, I'm taking Alastair Clarkson one million times over. Yeah, I think if you've had the same messages and the same sort of. Uh, same voice for 15 years. I think it can get a little old no matter how successful he's been. So I think it's sort of a right time for a new era. And I think if Sam Mitchell's waiting in the wings and he's untried, but he seems like uh, one of the better assistant coaches going around, I think you don't really want him uh, going to another club before you get first crack at him. So I think it's like a nice seamless uh, entry into coaching for Sam Mitchell because he's going to get the protection of Alistair Clarkson next year. Um, So if they have poor results, it sort of goes to, you know, Clarko cops the the brunt of it because he's still coaching and he gets that extra year to develop the list. And then when he has his first year in the chair, they're going to be two or three years ahead of the time, um, opposed to just sacking Clarko now and putting Mitchell in. So I think it's sort I, of I do I do understand the logic and I yeah I'm not saying that it's the worst decision of all time. Um I'm sure Jeff Kennett knows what he's doing. But uh you know I, and the whole conversation has been around you know it was the same with Buckley and whatnot. Do you want the same voice 
talking to your club for 10 plus years, 15 plus years? Um, or is it better to have a freshen up, even if this guy is uh, the mastermind behind a dynasty and your greatest ever coach? Um, and I do understand that logic that perhaps you just need a freshen up from time to time. But I'm imagining my, myself as an 18-year-old kid. And rem- remember, all these people he, he was uh, coaching 15 years ago, your Franklins, your Mitchells, your Hodges, mm. they're not there anymore. Um, you know, it is a fresh group of kids. So it's not like they're there going, oh, we've been, been listening to Clarker for 15 years. Can we get a new voice? You know, yeah. they've only had him for a couple. Um, and if I'm an 18-year-old kid walking into that football club and I'm getting told by Alistair Clarkson, arguably the greatest cl- coach of all time, how to play football, I think <laughs> that uh, I'm not sitting there going, gee, I wish we had a fresh voice. I'm sitting there just so grateful that I'm learning from the very best to ever do it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think Cornsy was thinking that Kane Corns thought similar. He, he didn't really understand the decision. He thought you'd take Clark over Mitchell every day. So, look, I hope it works out for the Hawks, and I'm wrapped with it because there's, that means there's a chance Clarko comes to the mighty blue baggers. Uh, but, uh, yeah, strange one for mine. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see, especially if Clarko coaches again, who can snag that flag uh, the quickest out of the two. Uh, Imagine if Mitchell's flopping and Clarko comes to Carlton and wins us a flag. You know, <laughs> it could be some of the all-time great egg on the face. <laughs> that's um, yeah, that's very positive thinking. I don't mind it. Uh, there was a big clash, and it's going to be when this comes out. It's going to be almost seven days ago, which is quite funny doing a podcast with the Thursday and Monday night games. Um, it, yeah. it makes this seem like old news, but there was a big top four defining clash. Um, it was the D's and the power, and going into it. There was a lot of chatter about, I think I might have mentioned it, you know, the D's could be fifth by the end of round 17. Um, To fast forward a couple of days and, oh, you know, fast forward around, they finished on first. I don't think anyone would have seen that coming. But how did you see the Thursday night clash between two of uh, the top teams who are contending at the moment? Well, I said to uh, me and uh, my longest mate, Michael Allen, uh, he, we are both on top of our tipping. There's about 20 of us in there. And we're very open when we talk about our tipping. It's not like we try and hide it and we wait until after the <laughs> yeah. game to see who each other tipped. Um, I said, who are you tipping in Port and Dees? And he said, Port Adelaide. And remember, he's my arch rival. We're top of yeah. the table. I said, don't tip the power, mate. Tip the D's. Port are uh, pretenders. They look <laughs> they they look good against all the sides below them, but they don't look good against the top, the sides above them. And D's are the opposite. D's, they have the ability to lapse against the worst teams. That's perhaps when they switch off mentally. Mm. But against the best teams, they show that they are the best team. They've beaten the best. Um, so Port, and then I didn't actually know it was uh, this extreme until after the game when the <laughs> stat came out. But I didn't realise that Port haven't beaten a side inside the eight. Is that correct? Or maybe they've beaten one? Uh, they beat one side. In- they beat Richmond, but they're not in the eight at the moment. Yeah. And uh, the D- uh, whereas the Ds are yet to lose to a side in the eight, I think. Yeah. So, or, or maybe you've lost to one. So um, I couldn't believe some people were... Uh, so many people, almost a majority, were tipping Port Adelaide. And um, I did watch the whole game, and I just think that Melbourne are the most professional outfit in the league <laughs> once again. Um, and you just go about your business, and uh, anyone who wants to doubt you again, do it at your peril. It felt like a finals-type build-up. There was a lot on the line. Um, it was Port Adelaide's chance to really make that statement. I reckon we flagged it round five or six that they had the pretender qualities. Um, it was their loss against West Coast and then their loss against Brisbane despite beating Richmond. And we sort of flagged it in one of the podcasts. Is this pretender, uh, pretender form? And it's just grown from then. They've had uh, some poor performances at home to the Western Bulldogs, Geelong. So this was the big one against the Ds, who seemingly were stumbling a little bit, and they couldn't. They were gettable. Yeah, they were gettable. Absolutely gettable, and they still couldn't get it done. And I think it is a great sign for the Melbourne Footy Club, um, considering you know everyone's waiting for the cliff to arrive and for them to fall off. But a win like that really cements them as a team that is genuinely contending. So it was a very professional win. I think it would have done wonders for the Demons' confidence because after a couple of losses um, and, you know, the potential of sliding out the four, um, if you had have lost that one, the the monkey on the shoulder just grows and grows and yeah. grows and all of a sudden you start to think, 
Maybe it was all hype at the start. Maybe the wheels have fallen off. Um, but that win, I think, reminded your team that you are the best team in the competition and you're on top of the ladder for a reason. And I think that will give you all the confidence in the world heading into September. Yep, for sure. And it was a win that shaped the top four. Um, there was a couple of other results that did shape the top four, which we'll get to. But the top eight is not set. It is one of the most even years I can think of. And there was some massive results that uh, shaped the top four and the top eight, Roggie? Well, my whipping boys are <laughs> starting to prove me wrong and I'm having to eat my words. But I, there is nothing I love more than eating my own words. <laughs> I, I, it's, it, it doesn't say that I was wrong. It says that they've responded. Yes. Uh, and, and I'll have a response. So, um, you know, when I think I, I may have bagged Sam Wiedemann at one point or another and uh, I labelled him a, a failed key forward that uh, will never make the grade. And then he came out a couple of years ago in a, uh, in a final and absolutely dominated. He looked like Wayne Carey. Uh, and I told the weed face to face when we uh, did an interview with him. <laughs> Mate, I wrote you off and you've made, proved me wrong and I can't wait to see you blossom into the best key forward in the competition. So uh, this uh, uh, this podcast, I've absolutely berated the Gold Coast Suns mm. and I've absolutely berated uh, the St Kilda Saints. And boy, are they both starting to play some good football. Go, Gold Coast won the last two and they're showing so much fight and grit. Um, and once this is something that I heard uh, Kane Corns, once again, my inspiration, uh, say during the week, and I tend to agree with him. Um, oh, no, sorry. It wasn't It wasn't Kane Corns. It was far from my inspiration. It was arguably my least favourite football <laughs> personality, Robbo. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Robbo, Slobbo, said that uh, whenever Gold Coast lose a game, which is very often, we always tend to say, oh, when are the kids going to want to come home? You know, yeah. this is this is exactly the reason why. Another disappointment loss. Why would you want to play at the Gold Coast with no fans, no wins when you could play in Melbourne? Um, but we don't tend to talk about it when they win. We don't say this is why they want to stay because they're the ultimate underdogs. They're all young 22-year-olds playing together and they can upset the world. So a massive win like that, a one or two point win against the Giants, I think that could really galvanise the squad yep. and have them saying to each other, lads, this is what we can build towards. We build on this. We keep on winning. We can make a charge, maybe not next this year, but next year towards finals and we could shut the, shut the whole country up. And I would personally would find that an unbelievable motivation to stay. I think this is the crop that can grow. I think this is the, like they don't need any more kids. They've got enough kids and I think the kids that they've got are good enough to play finals football in a few years and it just feels like if they stick together with this Ben King, Rankin, Raul Anderson, Lacocious group then and keep adding to it with maybe some stars. Can they jag... Maybe not a Gary Ablett, but can they jag a genuine B plus grader to help, uh, you know, be the experience for these kids to keep developing? Um, I see their future being quite bright and about time they start putting together wins in the back half of the season because, as we know, teams who have good form at the back half of years can continue the momentum into the next season and they've just fallen off the face of the earth after round four, five, six in years gone by. So they're jagging wins, they're jagging big scalps. The Tigers and the Giants are around them on the ladder and they've pipped them. So I think it's really important and it's just making the finals race so exciting. And when you get a couple of wins on the boards and uh, con consecutive wins is so important because one win, you know, it, it stops people bagging you for a little while. But two wins in a row, people start talking about your possibilities going forward. You know, it starts yep. talking about your future. And uh, players that perhaps were unknown to the football community or never really got the light they deserved because they're just playing in a lot, uh, a losing Gold Coast side, start to get a bit more intention when you get two, three wins in a row. And someone like a, a Will Powell um, down in the back line there, he's starting to impress me now. He's, th th these are the sort of players who are relatively unknown to a lot of the footy world, but if they're given their right time to shine and playing in a good a good team with a good brand of football that are winning games, they could be anything. So I'm starting to get a bit more optimistic about the Gold Coast and Stewie Jew. And uh, yeah, I hope they stay together with the motivation being, lads, let's shut the football world up and let's do what no one, literally no one thinks we can do and win a flag at the Gold Coast. And um, listening to Tony Cochran, who 
is a bit of a clown, but I don't mind him. He is the passion and the leader that that place needs. Um, <laughs> just a cheeky little drive by there. Well, he, <laughs> he's a bit. He's a bit of a clown, well, uh, but I like him. <laughs> well, it, it gives me sort of um, Eddie Maguire on steroids vibes. Like he's just so yep. out there, but he's what they need. And he talks about the market that's up there and um, the amount of population that that place is going to grow. So it, they can't leave Gold Coast. They just simply can't. Like it. I know we look at their 20,000 members and, you know, their 10,000 people that go to the game, but it is just about to explode up there. So to already have an established team and in the next few years have an established winning team, I think they could become a really solid club in the future. Well, they always talk about the grassroots down there and and, uh, I don't know the stats and figures, but they talk about how much the grassroots footy has grown in uh, the Sunshine State since the Gold Coast arrival. So, who knows, hopefully in 10, 15 years you will see the, it boom up there. And I don't know if you ever listened to Peter Volandis from the NRL, but he just does not shut up about the AFL. He's always begging us. He's always saying mm. they're trying to take our territory, but they'll never they'll never be able to take rugby from, from Queensland or anything. But you listen to Gillian McLaughlin, he never speaks about the NRL. He never talks about Peter Volandis because we don't need to. We yeah. have no fear of... Because They are er seemingly irrelevant to us by all intents and purposes. But the reason why Peter Volandis is making all this noise is because it is a genuine threat. If we were no threat, he wouldn't be talking about us. Why would he? We're not a threat. He does see us as a threat. He does see Gold Coast potentially stealing uh, young rugby fans, converting them into football fans up there. And uh, that's why he won't shut up about the AFL. So he's hoping Gold Coast are a powerhouse in 10 years. I'm still a bit dubious, but I'd love to see it. Um, but the other team, yes, they are uh, starting to shut a few people up uh, and I love to see it because I love Brett Radden, uh, is the St Kilda Footy Club. They Can they make the charge to finals and make the top eight like so many people thought they would this year, McDonald? Well, there's a handful. There's a handful that can and I can't believe that I'm saying they can. I cannot believe I that I'm saying it. I thought they were gone for all money. I thought this was a wasted year. I don't know how they have jagged win after win in a row. And if you count the Adelaide game, which they should have won, they would have been right in the hunt. Uh, They're a chance for sure. And I see West Coast really vulnerable. I see Richmond out of the finals race. So there is a spot for the Saints, a Freo, a Giants uh, and the like. I can't believe, I've only just looked at the ladder now. It's the first time I've really looked at it in depth properly. I can't believe Fremantle are seventh. You know, they're not yep. they're not just clinging on to eighth by um one percent. They're, they're not in. they're not they're not tenth and you know by two points and a win and a couple of right results could get them in there. I can't believe Fremantle are seventh and it makes me feel so shit about my football club because <laughs> We I talk, we were talking about at the start of the season, all oh, the top eight's going to be hard to get into. When We can't see any teams dropping out. Richmond aren't going to be dropping out. You know, they, mm. It was like, where is this spot in the eight going to come from? Yet here we are, and it is wide open. There's about three spots. <laughs> there's about three spots wide open. It's not like, will the top eight change? Can one team slide in? Mm. It's on for young and old, and anyone can take it. And if my football club wasn't so pathetic, <laughs> we'd, be, we'd be there or thereabouts. So I, it does upset me to see Fremantle in at seventh. But yeah. St Kilda out on percentage, Fremantle, West Coast, St Kilda on the same amount of points, GWS the two points behind them, and then one bin win, just one win outside the eight is Essendon, and wow. they look so impressive. And Essendon have a relatively easy run home. I've done the ladder predictor, so for the first time this uh, year, I've done my homework for the podcast. Yep, um, and I had Essendon finishing eighth because wow. Uh, yeah, they do have um, a relatively easy run home. And by relatively easy, I mean they need to win their next four games. Uh, oh, sorry, their next four. And they need to win four of the last few games. And three of them are, you know, if by all, if they're the team they think they are, they should win them comfortably. Yep. And then they've got sort of three or f- other games. Uh, one is a 50-50 and then the other two they could potentially jag an upset and I see that happening. So um, I see Essendon getting in there but uh, it really is anyone's game. It is, yeah, it is so exciting. It, it's just funny how many hurdles these teams are falling over and it just speaks about the evenness of the competition but North Melbourne are shaking up the top eight race 
uh, with victories and the way they're playing. So uh, there, there's teams like the North Melbourne and, and, you know, Hawthorne beating GWS and Gold Coast knocking off the Tigers and stuff. These bottom three, four teams are shaping the finals and it's just so, so exciting. Yeah, well, if you had told anyone at the start of the year that Essendon are going to be making the finals when they had them one of them... No, I was about to say the most tumultuous off-season, but I think that'll go to the pies. <laughs> um, but one of the worst off-season, losing all these plays and, and you know, going back to the draft and all the supporters are there going, we haven't won a final in 45,000 days and we're rebuilding again. We're starting again. This is bullshit. Yet here we are, uh, Sardi jump ship to Carlton and we're nowhere to be seen, yet Essendon are every chance of making the eight. So as much as it pains me to say, uh, because we have talked about how the – the uh, rat bags of the Essendon fan base can be the worst rat bags of any <laughs> supporter base. And uh, they are probably, if I'm being honest, my most hated team. But <laughs> I absolutely love that they're shutting me up and I love what they're doing. I love they're proving the whole footy community were wrong. And I hope they do actually make the eight, to be honest. Yeah, well, I tipped them for the wooden spoon in my uh, <laughs> season predictions. I just saw three stars for their side walk out and I saw three skinny kids walk in I thought well you can't be better than what you were last year and you weren't that good last year um, and they're sort of the same as what they were last year to be fair but in a better position list wise so it is exciting times um, did you see the Monday night game over in the west uh, the Monday night game in the west the Eagles, the Eagles uh, and the Roos I did in fact see that game McDonald uh, and I actually only saw the last quarter uh, and uh, the Banu- the mighty Banuel Football Club. We have a punters club going for our footy trip. We're going up to Echuca. And uh, this was the first week where we all chipped in uh, 50 or 100 bucks. I can't remember. And our plan was each week we'll whack it on a dollar twenty or a dollar thirty pop. Uh, so there's you know thirty blokes going a hundred bucks each. That's three grand on a dollar thirty pop each week. Yep. By the time we go to footy trip, hopefully we have I can't remember the number, but it was something like over ten grand, and that'll pay for our all of our drinks and uh, expenses on the trip. So re- our first round of tipping, we put it all on the West Coast Eagles, and boy were we disappointed. Oh no. We thought a dollar thirty or whatever they were in Perth. We'll, we'll have it all on that. A nice, easy, cozy win for the West. In the we know they're pretenders. We know that, but we also know that they love playing at Optus Stadium. And North mm. Melbourne aren't much chop, even though they have looked better in the last few weeks. And yeah, a bit disappointing. But I was wrapped to see West Coast uh, get done at Optus. It's always a great sight, and I just love seeing North Melbourne. Uh, win games when everyone said they won't win a game all season. North Melbourne have been so impressive uh, the last few weeks and the last sort of the second half of the year, to be honest. And um, Jaden Stevenson had 38 touches. He had 25 of those in the second half. And just watching the game... uh, Sorry, Dossie, please, uh, Collingwood supporters, comment if you're watching on YouTube or DM us um, if you're just listening on Spotify. Uh, What you feel about Jaden Stevenson doing that for North Melbourne? Because I could imagine being a Collingwood supporter and, you know, some of the other players that were on the real big contracts or whatnot that you had to let go, all right, it's disappointing, but it makes a bit of sense, I suppose, but... Mm. The Jaden Stevenson one was a weird one, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a weird one. Especially, he won the Rising Star for them like two seasons before it. That is your future. So, yeah, it doesn't really make any sense at all. And I didn't know he had this in his kit bag. He sort of plays, he pinch hits in the midfield. Um, North supporters will probably tell me he plays all game in the midfield. But I was seeing him going forward and then going into the mid. And um, he, it was wet. It was, uh, it was uh, really tough, wet. Um, high pressure contested footy and he looked like he was playing in the dry like he was really cool calm and collected Davies Uniac was unbelievable um, Zerha kicked two six he could have really had a day out at the office and then Larky was presenting really really well and they were just so hungry for that win and when there was 10 minutes to go and uh, West Coast had kicked four in a row and had North on the back foot I'm sort of rolling my eyes going ah oh damn, you know, this would have been a great finish, but now West Coast are going to run away with it. But the the Roos boys rolled their sleeves up, dug super, super deep, and they were hungry. Once they could sniff it, they were really, really hungry, and it was an unbelievable victory. Yeah, I'm so stoked for North Melbourne, and I love their coach. I think he speaks really well, and I see him taking the Roos to the promised land, doing big things. Hopefully they've land that big fish off season, and we'll see them finally catapult themselves back into the eight. All right, perfectly put, Rog. And now we're going to move on to one of our favourite segments, one of our only segments. 
Uh, we're going to move on to the GBOs, and I'm going to get you to kick it off with your O this week, Roggie. You're out on the full. Yes. Uh, I was talking about how proud, proud may not be the right word because I do actually really hate them, but how uh, impressed I am by Essendon. Um, winning by 10 goals against the Crows and catapulting themselves into finals contention and proving a lot of people wrong. But Adelaide, you know, Tex goes down and they don't really have a plan B and... They're only scoring 21 points against Essendon, and that's just not on. Essendon, they're not a Melbourne. They're not a team that's impossible to penetrate. They're a young side. They're very vulnerable. And, uh, you know, Kane Corns has been referenced a few times this episode, but he came out at the start of the season and he said, uh, this Adelaide Adelaide side is the worst to ever pull on the the jumper, the worst list to pull on the jumper. And at the start of the season, it did look like they were proving a few people wrong uh, and shutting him up, but... Um, as the season starts to wear on and progress and the players are starting to get tired, it's becoming obvious that maybe Kane Corns was right. Um, they've had a few very disappointing losses. And uh, 10 goal, only scoring 21 points and losing by 10 goals against Essendon probably isn't good enough for mine and they are my clear out of the full for this week. And uh, I think it's probably time for a little bit of a clip considering they have over-exceeded a few expectations and been quite brave and you can sort of see where they can go with this team but I think it's probably overdue and probably a little bit fair that um they finally get their whack that's a great out on the full Roggy I'm going to go with out on the full and um, I believe it bleeds into your behind so we'll both sort of openly discuss this but uh, the Jamara Eugle Hagen debut was very very interesting to me, um, I'm never, ever going to pot a bloke who plays his first game. A lot of people were writing him off and being quite critical. So I don't want to go down that route. But just the selection of him was quite interesting. I think Bevo's been really strong all year in not playing him. And um, I think it's sort of been justified because he hasn't been banging the door down necessarily in the VFL. But to be brought in... Um, I know Norton went out. I'm not 100% sure where the Shackmeister was, but Jamara finally got his run, Sunday Arvo footy, and everything he touched turned turned to rubbish, to be honest, the poor fella. It was a sort of... It was a tough debut for him. Um, and, yeah, I'm just sort of questioning the, uh, the selection of him a little bit. Yeah, so he was my behind, and the reason he's my behind is because I have nothing against Jamara. It's not his fault he's mm. gotten picked, and I still think he's going to one day probably be one of the best players in the competition. Yeah, so, for sure. But uh, he, the selection was an interesting one. Just bec- And people say he's the number one draft pick. Why isn't he playing? Just because you turn 18 doesn't mean you're ready for AFL football. For five years between 18 and 23, I couldn't get a kick in the Division Two reserves at local level and this is the first top first season um that i feel like i've actually grown into my body so to speak i'm starting to understand it a bit better mm. and i'm starting to play some decent footy so i don't expect them to wait until 23 to play jamara but he's an 18 or maybe he's probably 19 year old kid you know and he looks like a kid uh, mm. i know he's a big big lad but he hasn't got an afl body yet and he he's he's fitness, his strength, it's just not up to AFL level. So I think you're doing him probably, maybe one game could be okay, give him a taste of it so he understands and learns how far off the pace he is. So when he goes back to the twos, it makes him work harder. If that's the logic, then I'm all for it. I think that makes a lot of sense. Because if he's in the twos, probably underperforming, because he hasn't been banging the door down and he's knocking on Bevo's door and it, every week and he's saying, Bevo, give me a game, I'm ready. Maybe Bevo's going, you're not ready, you're not ready, you're not ready. It comes to this week and he goes, I'm going to give you a game just so you understand how not ready you are and how yeah, much you have to true. work to become ready. So if that's the logic, then I'm all for it. But some people seem to think that uh, the logic is apparently Sydney. Um, a red hot on getting Jamara over, teaming him up with Logan McDonald to make a formidable forward line mm. for the next 15 years. Um, and if the dogs panicked and went, gee, we don't want Jamara to go, we're just going to gift him a game, then I think you're probably doing him a bit more harm than good there. Do you reckon there was a lot of questions? Like Bevo's gotten frustrated throughout the year getting asked about Jamara at every press conference. Do you reckon there was a little bit of, Oh God! I'll just play him for the sake of it. Or do you reckon like that got into nah, the conversation at all? 
I don't see Bevo being like that at all. In fact, I think the constant questioning probably led him in the opposite direction, True. if anything. Yeah. Um, and went, no, because the last thing you want is for everyone to be saying, where's Jamara, where's Jamara? And then he gets this big head and this overinflated ego and you play him and he thinks he's a superstar. I think Bevo yeah. did the right thing. Everyone's asking, where's Jamara? And he would have been saying to him, I have no doubts behind closed doors. We are not playing you until you are ready for AFL football. You need to prove yourself in the twos first uh, and then we'll bring you in. So, yes, Jamara, he will be a star one day and at the end of the day, um, he's with Mia Favola, so he can't be too unhappy anyway. <laughs> yeah, he, he'll get it going, Jamara. Um, you know, another preseason, and you've got to take into account these sort of kids haven't played footy for 12 months. They obviously didn't play all of last year. So um, he's going to be an exciting prospect, uh, no doubt. I'll move on to my behinds, and it was just some of the injuries this week, Rogie. Um, Zachy Butters, a fan favourite, came in after a long time out with his ankle and unfortunately I think he hurt his knee and it seems like that could be a lengthy one. Eric the Eel, one of the most exciting and uh, important members of the Brisbane Lions I, forward um, line. I actually miss this. What did, what did Eric the Eel do to himself? A-C-L. Did he? He did. So he is Far out, gone. Russell Sprout. He's, so, out for the, he's out for 12 months. He's going to miss the grand final, maybe. Well, yeah, he could miss two, um, the way the lines are going. Um, so he is in, yeah, he's, he's out with an ACL. And that really shakes up their forward line because Joe Danaher is going to have to do a lot of the work. He's now going to get double teamed, triple teamed. Your Dan, Daniel McStay is now not the role player. He's going to have to um, carry a lot more of the load. So that's sort of... Um, yeah, Mick Stay can play a bit. I'm I'm a bit of a quiet fan of Mick Stay. I, he's got I like some of the about. great the greatest hands. He, he sticks has, his got, marks. Ge- Gecko hands and a big boy, <laughs> just a big lump of a lad. I reckon he can. I reckon he could be one where Eric the Eel goes down, Linguini arms Hipwood, and you see <laughs> uh, you see Mick Stay come in, and people go, oh, he's, he, the coming of age role, like when Paddy Ryder had to go into the mm. ruck for Essendon. I think it might have been on Anzac Day, and he. He really stamped his authority on the competition. So, uh, yeah, I know that your behind was Eric the Eel, but uh, I'm starting to get a big, bit excited about <laughs> Big Mick Stay. I wonder, you know, maybe they – I think they delisted Matty Eagles, but, geez, that would have been a story if he just came in, played a role, won a flag. Um, the big Matty Eagles man. But, yeah, and – We then, can only dream the recruit. <laughs> the recruit. And then the last one was Hugh Greenwood. I think he escaped the ACL injury, but he's done – a significant knee injury as well. So just a little bit disappointing. Um, it's this exciting time of the year and it's sort of that time of the year where if you're out, you're out for a long time and probably out for the season. So a little bit disappointing and my behinds are just a couple of those injuries. I can't believe you've made um, Jamara Oogle Hagen, you're out in the full and you've made injuries your behinds. Yeah, surely, how, how have I done that? Yeah, surely we, we swap that one around there, McDonald, but that's okay. <laughs> no, and good point. Uh, uh, my goal, and I don't know if I'll pay a better goal all season, even if I was David Roden standing in between the sticks, I don't think I could pay a better goal than this. And it is Charlie Curnow's return game back to the VFL this upcoming week. It was announced over the weekend that, yes, it's time. Charlie Curnow, after two years out, will return. And, God, that fills my heart with joy. You know, there was times there where I legitimately thought he could be done. Like, he could, we might not see Charlie Curnow back again. Um but you know, we need people need to remember that he was the superstar. Mackay was the second fiddle, and to a large degree, an afterthought. Mac- mm. Charlie, I, th- I think the f- the football world has forgotten a bit about how good Charlie Kerno was progressing. Like we're talking hangers weekly goals from outside fifty. Doing, my, me and Mike were talking about it the other day. We were talking about what sort of footballer is he? Is he a explosive? Um, Dustin Martin, Jake Stringer type who bobs up and you know breaks packs, kicks four. Is he a Buddy Franklin type that just kicks goals outside fifty? I'm not saying he's better than any of these guys. I'm just saying he's a completely different look player than what we're used to seeing. He is a super athlete, super fit, unreal hands, unreal kick, exciting X factor, has it all. So I cannot wait to see him back wearing the navy blue, and I. Pray the all the excitement is met with an equal amount of nerves because if he does another injury again, I will cry. I think it's great for the competition. He's someone that the AFL needs. He plays like a pretty solid key forward that has the 
attributes of like a jumping sort of springy ruckman type. I, I, sort of um, sort of more springy than Luke Jackson, but he's sort of in between like a Lukey Jackson and Buddy Franklin and just this lively, tall target who can do it all. Um, I think it's exciting for the competition that he comes back and I hope that um, he can stay injury-free, the big fella. Absolutely, fingers crossed. Uh, I'm going to move on to my goal. I sort of mentioned it halfway through the pod, but it is just the evenness of the competition. It doesn't get much better than this, to be honest. Um, as much as I'm excited that the Ds are a win um, on top of the ladder, I know we're one result away from being back within the pack. And, you know, a week ago we were almost slipping to fifth and now we're not. And, you know, Sydney knocking off the Bulldogs means that they're one step closer to the four and it takes the Bulldogs one step closer to the pack and all the upsets that are happening in the lower part of the eight and just outside the eight just makes for such an exciting competition, even to the point where uh, if the North Melbourne Footy Club didn't draw a couple of weeks ago to GWS, they would now be only percentage off being off the bottom of the ladder. So it's just evenness everywhere. It's what we've always wanted for the fixture, usually this time of year, there are dead rubber 440 games galore. Right now, every game is for something. So it's just a super exciting time to be an AFL fan. And it could be the best season ever, to be honest. I think I think it could be. Usually at this point, you've got your main contender, maybe your top two contenders, and you, you're going, will anyone be able to knock this team off? The conversation might be, we know Richmond's the best team, but gee, if Geelong play their best footy at the best mm-hmm. time, can they knock them off? But this is a season where you ask for anyone, they'll say, oh, my flag favourite is the Dogs, the Cats, the Ds, the Lions. So, and then now you've got Sydney and, you know, potentially maybe if they turn it on Port Adelaide. Um, so, yeah, you're right. Anyone can make, uh, anyone could win the grand final. And, uh, out of those sort of five or six teams. And then to have this wide open race for the eight um, where teams like Richmond and Essendon are still, you know, contending for it and mm. they're 11th and 12th and we're only talking separated by one win. You know, Carlton, as pathetic as they have been and they, they will not make the eight, there are only two wins out of it as well. And, you know, you you turn it on at the right time of the season, you win, you pull four games in a row out of your buttocks and... Uh, <laughs> Anything can happen. So it is wide open. Anyone can make the eight. And at the bottom half of the table as well, and I know, you know, this obviously and rightfully so doesn't get the same amount of conversation as the top half of the table. But you've got North Melbourne, who were not meant to win a game on 14 points. Uh, Hawthorne on 16. Then you've got Adelaide and Collingwood on 20. And North are in good form, sort of. So, you know, we don't know who's going to win the wooden spoon either. It's not like you just have your Carlton down there and they're the wooden spooners or your Gold Coast or wherever it may be. So it is... Completely even to a degree um, throughout the ladder. And uh, this will be quite possibly the greatest final series of all time. It is so good. And I think like even though the scores haven't been, um, you know, opened up, I think the footy is just so exciting to watch. It is just, you know, there's a little bit of tempo from the back line, but when teams pull the trigger and go, you can get through a little bit. And then it's just that pressure on the defence. Why... um why do you think it is so equal at the moment? Is it quite simply equalisation is finally starting to do its job to full effect? Or do you think potentially every club has maybe adapted pretty much the exact same game plan to a degree? And, uh, you know, it, as Sydney have taught us, it's pretty much, it's more plan than it is personnel to a degree. You know, you can have the best mm. personnel, but if you don't have the best plan, you're not going to be making finals. So is it... Do you consider it to be equalisation kicking in or do you think maybe everyone's just playing a similar brand and that's showing equal results? Well, I, I think no matter where you go as an AFL footballer, you are in an elite environment. Like there's not many places, like the Gold Coast Suns, you know, have been pretty average for a couple of years. But I think if you walked into that environment, it is an elite place to be in terms of the uh the the footy science or the the sports science to the coaching to the vision to so like every club is working their asses off to be great and i think afl teams are a lot closer um than what people think and i think it's just being proved now more than ever maybe because of the equalization um but i i watch every simon goodwin press conference and for two or three years now he goes 
AFL footy is bloody hard. Like, you know, e- even if we win or lose, we might win and we've knocked off a lowly side, but he goes, and it might not be convincing, he goes, I don't think you guys are giving the credit uh, that the competition deserves. It is bloody hard. It's bloody hard to win consistently. It's, you know, every team on their day can win. And it's one of the only sports in the world at the minute where that can happen. Like, teams are beating the Premier from the year before and then losing to the current uh, wooden spooner. So it is just so even at the minute. And, um, yeah, it's great. We are blessed. We are grateful. And we can't wait to watch another six weeks of it in the lead-up to finals, Dusty. I'm so excited. And we'll be here to chat about it uh, along the way. Roggie, um, thanks for joining me. Uh, what, what have you got? What have you got coming up? What have you got planned? I've got a litre of coconut water in the fridge that I'm dry as a Sahara at the moment, so I can't wait to go inside and neck that down. Then I've got uh, footy training, um, which we're excited for. I'm going to do a tax return somewhere in there, hopefully make myself a couple of grand. The podcast doesn't pay for itself. (laughs) Uh, And then off to footy training, mate, to show why I'm the best back pocket plugger in the business. (laughs) Yeah, perfect. Um, I'm just about to go through my routine um, in the lead up to some Div 4 basketball at the Geelong Arena. I'm probably going to go for a walk, do a little bit of meditating, do a good stretch, get into the mindset and head over uh, to that game. We're undefeated and we're on top, so hoping to continue the winning form. Um, But that's it from us at the Back Pocket Plugger podcast. Uh, We want to thank everyone who tuned in. We want to thank everyone who watched as well on the YouTube channel. And we'll see you all next week to chat some more footy. Keep plugging those back pockets.